Hey everyone. So today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, a very relevant topic to all of our lives. This is the idea how worthiness, the feeling that you are inherently worthy, how that can be actually used as a remedy against things like anxiety. And the idea of having a certain sense of inner satisfaction, an inner sense of joy, that these can be very useful tools, that this overall sense of well-being can be a very useful tool in combating all sorts of negative emotions that may come your way. And the, the, first, the first thing that I think it's important to address when it comes to this idea of personal well-being, uh, especially in talking about how worthiness is sort of an antidote to anxiety, is this a feeling that a person should be able to attain within themselves that they are worthy, that they are loved, that they are connected with the divine, that they do have a purpose in this world. Because as the, the, the truth of the matter is that there is a very strong link between a person's sense of purpose and a person's sense of overall well-being, a person's sense of happiness. Uh, the, the very, they are very interconnected. Purpose and happiness are actually uh, perhaps even two sides of the same coin. A person can only be really happy in a, in a long-term sense if they feel that they have a sense of purpose in the world. In fact, the very first thing that a person will ask uh, themselves or whatnot when, when a person is not feeling happy is what's the point of all of this? In other words, when the happiness goes away, even if it's temporarily, the very first thing that the person goes to is what's the point of all this? What's the purpose? Because of the fact that purpose and happiness uh, tend to be two sides of the same coin. A person can't have purpose or can't fulfill their purpose without being happy or having a sense of well-being. And a person also can't have a sense of happiness or well-being without feeling that they have a sense of purpose. So this, this is there is a strong link between the two, and we're going to discuss how the feeling of worthiness, that you have inherent value, can be a tool that is utilized and effective against combating anxiety. Now, with joy... Uh, the concept of joy, living with joy, is a very central idea to the Torah mindset person. person who lives a Torah life, a person who lives in sync with what the Torah prescribes for a person, knows the idea that living with joy is extraordinarily central. And so this is emphasized in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 47, where the Torah cites the terrible consequences that are going to befall those who deviate from the Torah. And what does the Torah tell us as why, what is the reason that they are, that they are going to befall these consequences? Because they did not serve God with joy. It's, a, it's an automatic result that if a person doesn't serve God with joy, doesn't live a life filled with joy, that there's going to be challenges that come their way. This, there, it's a one or the other situation. And the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, repeatedly stressed the importance of the idea of simcha, the importance of the idea of joy, living it with a joyful mindset. And if one, the truth is, if one were to encapsulate the entire foundation of the Hasidic movement, of the Hasidic worldview, into one phrase, it would be, Simcha is in, uh, despair is out. Okay, and that would be the, the core, perhaps the nucleus of all of Hasidic thought. If we understand Simcha, joy, to be spiritual elation, rather than the gratification of our physical desires, it becomes evident that self-esteem is an essential for simcha. Spiritual joy is dependent on a feeling that a person is worthwhile, that you are worth it, you are worthwhile, you have purpose, uh, that your life has a purpose, that there is a significance in your existence in the universe. That is something so inherent to, to having a sense of well-being, to having a continuous sense of joy. It's interesting. One of the most interesting things with this regard, and we see it so clearly, is that the ultimate in human error, 
the ultimate in human transgression in Jewish thought, in Torah thought, is the sin of idolatry, avodah zara. So idolatry uh, actually began, had its roots, had its origin in low self-esteem. How so? The Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, says that during the, during the early generations uh, after Adam, so ev everyone, obviously, Adam and Eve, is, is it everyone came from Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve obviously knew the truth of the one God. That's, that's plain and simple. Uh, and Adam and Eve, Adam lived to be 930 years old, so he saw many generations come out from him, you know, son, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and through, throughout those multiple generations, the Rambam says that idolatry, the, the concept of other gods uh, in addition to the one supreme god of the earth, already began taking form during the days of Enosh, which was the grandson of, of, of Adam. And so you think... We have a generation, we have all these people, multiple generations that all see Adam and Eve, right? All grandma, grandma and grandpa, that, that they know that the God blew the breath of life into them. How could they start believing in other gods? How could they start worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, and all, all sorts of idols? How could it be? Well, the original premise was a, it was a false premise, but this was their premise, that God is... God's created the universe, sort of set the world into being, and then was disconcerned with what's going on here. In other words, God is very busy manipulating, creating universes and creating galaxies and manipulating the galaxies and keeping everything in, in existence. What does God care about little old me? What does God care about little old us in this vast universe of so much, infinite universe? What is going on? Why would God care what little old thing I do? And so, if I need something, if I need something, I'm going to go to the manager that God set up. In other words, if I'm a farmer and I need light and heat to grow my crops, I'm not going to ask God. God can't be bothered with me. God, I'm going to ask the sun directly, which God set up as a manager for the light and heat that is needed for, for me to grow my crops. And I'll just ask the sun directly rather than bothering God. God doesn't care about me. God is far removed from me. And they had sort of a deistic idea about God, that God created the universe, God was the, the founder of the universe, but that God was too busy with more important things than to be bothered with my concerns and, and my needs and my desires and to, to really have any sort of uh, meaningful relationship with me. God, God sort of bestowed those, those uh, attributes upon different management. And so the sun, the moon, the stars, all of these things, had they were the mechanisms in which I could ask directly for the things that I need because God can't be bothered with me. Right? The, so in other words, if you break it down, idolatry began to sprout because people did not believe that they were deserving of divine attention. People thought that God withdrew from direct involvement with his creation because it was beneath his dignity. Why should I bother myself with these lowly human beings? People thought that God withdrew from direct involvement with his creation mm -hmm. because it was beneath God's dignity to associate with such lowly beings. They assumed that God had turned over the operation of the world to the, the, the heavenly powers, uh, the, right, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, or to natural phenomena, or to idols which represented the natural forces. They, they, they therefore began to worship and seek favor from these powers. Okay, so it began with thinking, right? So it was really a low self-esteem thing that led to idolatry. Is God can't be bothered. I am not worthy of God's having a relationship with me. I'm not worthy of God being involved with me. And therefore they sought a connection with something that they thought that they were worthy of or that they could have sort of a, a legitimate uh, connection with. So the Rambam points out that Avodah Zarah, that idolatry, is not a denial 
of the existence of God, of the true God, but a denial of God's involvement with man, right? Which is which is really the the which had its origins in man's feeling unworthy of God's providence. It wasn't that they were seeking a new God, it's that they felt unworthy to be connected with God and therefore sought other things that they perhaps were more worthy to be engaged with. Mm -hmm. The essence of Jewishness, the essence of the Torah worldview, and the refutation of idolatry is therefore contingent upon mankind believing that they are indeed significant, that they are worthy of God's attention. And this is a this is a fundamental idea from a Torah mindset. You are worthy. The entire concept of commandments, of God bestowing commandments upon, man, upon mankind, is contingent upon the assumption that God wants us to conduct our lives in a certain manner. God cares what we do. Mitzvahs are inextricably bound to the belief that God maintains an interest in humankind. We pray to God, not to any intermediary, because we believe that God listens to our prayers. And God did not withdraw himself from us because of our infinitesimal nothingness. God is, inher God is essentially connected with us. And so positive self-esteem, positive self-image is essential for our relationship with God, for taking God into our lives and for dedicating ourselves to God and to, and to doing God's will. All of this is contingent upon feeling that you are worthwhile, that you were put here for a purpose. We can feel, right, it's only through that that we can feel that God never abandons us and that even in our times of suffering, as it says in the book of Psalms, chapter 91, verse 15, I am with him, with humankind, in his distress. Even if we can't reach the sublime state where we're accepting of suffering with joy, just the realization that God does not forsake us, that God that that suffering is never without purpose, just even if we can't see exactly how, just knowing that on the back burner, though, that permits us to experience joy in other phases and areas of our lives as well. As we come to accept our relationship. Uh, to God, that we can achieve the total dedication to Him. It's interesting. It says by King Solomon in the book of in, in the Song of in, excuse me in the book of Proverbs chapter three verse six, it says, "Know God in all of your ways." The idea is that as we engage, as we get to know th through Torah what God wants and and what our connection is like with Him. What is it that God's purpose is in this world? We can relate to God not only in the performance of the commandments, but we can also relate to him in the mundane acts as well. So we are, we, in, in, in that sense, we eat to sustain our strength so that we might know God, so that we may be able to further uh, perpetuate God's will in the world. We sleep to restore our energies. We work and we earn a living to attain all of the necessities of life. We have recreational activities to refresh ourselves. And all of these things that we're engaged in, in we're, we're striving to fulfill God's will. And we can thus find spiritual joy in everything that we do. If this is our mindset, this is the result that comes about from that. The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, once met a cantor. A cantor is the one that sings the, the songs, uh, particular in, in, the, in the services, in the, in, the, in the Jewish services. And it's customary to have a, a cantor with a particularly good voice and uh, knows the tunes very well, particularly on the high holidays. So the Baal Shem Tov encountered a cantor who was saying the prayers, the confessional prayers that are said on Yom Kippur, and typically the confessional prayers that are said on Yom Kippur are said with a very somber attitude, a very somber melody that, that comes along with them. After all, if you're talking about all of the sins that we've done throughout the year, all the th things we've done in action, all of the things we've done in speech, and all of the things we've done in thought, this is not particularly... Uh, this is a very somber, serious song that typically is sung with it. 
very very gut wrenching, very um, very deep and and cathartic type type music, the type of tune that accompanies it. Now, the Baal Shem Tov met a cantor that was singing this melody, was was going through all of the sins, all of the, all of the t- with a happy tune, with a joyous tune. It wasn't with the somber melody that's usually with. And so the Baal Shem Tov asked this cantor, "Why are you singing?" The prayer of confession, all these things that have that we've done wrong throughout the entire year. Why are you doing it with such a joyous tune? And so the cantor replied to him that if a devoted servant of a king is assigned the task of going to clean out the palace and remove all of the trash, wouldn't he be jubilant in the knowledge that he's beautifying the king's palace, that he's that he's cleaning up the palace and making it beautiful for the king again? Mankind is the palace of God because he resides within each and every one of us. When I confess my sins, the cantor said, and and dispose of all the objectionable matter that has accumulated within me, and thereby make myself into a clean palace that's more acceptable and suitable for a place for the king to reside, Shouldn't I rejoice? Wouldn't I be happy about that? I've made my palace clean. And so the idea is that we have this tremendous ability within each and every one of us. We are a spark of God. We are a piece of God. We are charged with a mission from God. And that is something very special and makes us very worthy. Now, we've defined self-esteem, the idea of self-esteem, as an awareness of our capabilities, an awareness that you have purpose, an awareness that you uh, not only have a purpose, but you were given the tools to carry out that purpose. It follows that we become increasingly aware, uh, as we become increasingly aware of our capabilities, the intensity of our joy should increase. If I become more aware of my purpose and more aware of the tools that I've been granted to achieve my purpose, well, the happier I'm going to become. Because purpose and happiness go hand in hand. And the more I'm in sync and in tune with my purpose, the happier I'm going to be. The person who feels that his life's mission is the performance of the will of God will likewise rejoice when they become aware of their talents and their skills and they can use that in the service of God. As a person's knowledge of Torah increases and they develop insights and greater, they have a greater capacity to understand the Torah, the, their, their, which is their purpose in this world, we experience true elation. The Torah is what, what points us in the direction of what our purpose is. So the more a person understands Torah, the greater you understand your purpose, the more happiness that that brings. It's, it's, a, it's a cycle. It's a, very, it's a very special, holy, good cycle that any person can increase in their own life. Now, there's, an another, there's another important relationship between self-esteem and joy. There's another, there's another um, relationship. People who feel themselves to be undeserving or sometimes people not only undeserving but worthless, are often haunted by the morbid fear that they do not merit joy, that they don't deserve to be happy, and that any happiness that they might experience will be short-lived. I've seen this time and again. They're actually afraid to be happy because they have a fear that if they are happy, the object of their joy is going to be taken away from them. Occasions that should be happy occasions, right, that should result in happiness, produce intense anxiety instead. Mothers who feel undeserving of nachas, of of pleasure, taking pleasure in their children, have experienced the terrifying and persistent fear that if they enjoy their children, something's going to happen to them. It, it, this, is, this is something that, that's found in all areas of a person's life. People with this kind of anxiety, right? It starts from not feeling worthy. And that, therefore, if they are happy, if they do take happiness, anything, they're going to lose it real quick because they're not worthy of receiving this bounty. They're not worthy of receiving this goodness. People with this kind of anxiety whose business ventures turn prosperous, right? You're, you invest some time in your business and things pick up. 
Things are going well. Things are going in the trajectory that you want them to go. They fear that it's some un, there's going to be some unforeseen economic cataclysm that's going to cause them catastrophic losses. These are people who do not permit themselves to enjoy what God has given to them. Sometimes the anxiety of anticipating disaster also can be so severe for the person, right? You're so consumed with the anxiety of what's going to happen and that I'm anticipating a disaster, I'm anticipating this being ruined. At any moment, it might be so severe in some people that they'll actually do something to precipitate the feared loss, right? They'll cause the downfall themselves in order to be free from the tormenting distress of suspense. In other words, in, in other, as long as... I'm having anxiety because I think at any moment things are going to take a turn for the worst... And I would rather cause the turn for the worst myself rather than living in this constant state of anxiety that any minute something's going to happen. And so the Torah approach can eliminate this terrible anxiety that a person might have. While it's true that a person shouldn't consider themselves deserving of the reward in, a, in an arrogant sense, right? That they deserve reward, that they feel that they've done something which should be rewarded, and that, that's, that's, that's arrogance. Nevertheless, we should also know that as children of our Father in Heaven, that we are loved by God, and that God is not out to get us. Although we might not consider ourselves deserving in an earned way, like what have I done that's so great that that is worthy of God uh, bestowing bounty upon my upon me in front of my in, in my life? Maybe I, maybe my sins are too much. Maybe maybe I haven't lived up to my purpose in this world. At the same time, we have to know God is not out to get us. That we are children of a loving God. That we are children of a. a what we call Avinu Malkeinu, not just Malkeinu, not just, uh, we don't just call God our king, we call him our father, our king, Avinu Malkeinu. He is our father in heaven. And with that, we are his children, and he's not, he wants to give to us in a way that is, that is, that is good for us. He wants to do good for us. We might not consider ourselves deserving in the earned reward sense, but we should know that we are beneficiaries of God's grace, being children of God. And so the Torah states that although the righteous might be justified in asking God for the reward that they've earned, right? If you're righteous, then you've certainly earned mm -hmm. what you are asking for. You earned what you get. They, they are, Rashi, the famed uh, medieval sage, the primary commentary on the Torah says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter, commenting on Deut Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 23, it says that the righteous ask God uh, in, for, for gifts, right? For doing it out of God's grace than out of, out of reward that, uh, that they've earned. The problem with people who have a negative self-image is that because of their self-deprecation, they consider themselves to be despised. If I feel worthless, I'm despised. I'm not loved by God. If I feel worthless, I think that God looks at me as worthless also. If I feel, if I despise myself, I feel that God despises me as well. I'm despised by God rather than loved by God, and therefore I'm unworthy even of God's grace. Forget not deserving it. Of course I don't deserve it. But I feel so loathsome. I feel so, like I, I, that I'm so worthless. That I'm so despised. I so despise myself that I believe that God despises me as well. And I'm not even worthy of God's grace. So the person with a low self-image, or the person with low self-esteem, is capable of... of, of uh, of being so self-abasing that he doesn't believe himself to be worthy uh, even of God's grace. Uh, and if left, if, if left without, the, um, he, 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 he winds up living a life that is uh, in morbid fear that happiness will be taken from him. 
He looks at himself as loathsome, as worthless. He thinks that God, therefore, looks at him as loathsome and, wor and worthless. And he always is going to live in a fear that sometime in the, in the near future, all the good that he has is going to be taken away from him. And this can result in anxiety and depression so severe that it interferes with living a normal and productive life. Appropriate enjoyment of life is something that's essential for Torah living as well. In fact, the Talmud, the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, says that one of the things, among the other questions that are going to be asked by a person when they are faced with the heavenly court at the end of their life is, did you enjoy my world? Meaning not, not that they... Not that the person indulged in every physical gratification that was, was meant to be, but did you live a life of constant anxiety? Did you live a life of constant despair and depression? Did you live a life, or did you enjoy life? Did you have, did you kind of have a, have, a, have a good time down there? So joy also has a special relationship, uh, by the way, with gratitude. People who are recipients of bounty and, and don't consider themselves worthy of this, in, in, in any, if, you don't, if you don't consider yourself worthy of bounty, right? You consider yourself loathsome, you consider your, and, you, and you do receive bounty, and you don't consider yourself worthy of this, you, you, can't, um, you, can feel, you, can't, you can't express gratitude. In other words, if I'm getting something that I feel I don't deserve, I can't be... I can't be. I can't have gratitude for it. I, I I wind up feeling guilty, right? The person feels guilty that they're receiving something that they don't that they don't deserve. Like God is giving this to me, and I don't deserve it. And that guilt leads to resentment, rather than gratitude for the giver. Why would it lead towards resentment? Well, if I'm feeling guilty, if you keep giving me something that I don't deserve, and I and I feel that I don't deserve that. That's going to lead to guilt. And if you are constantly giving me something that is making me feel more guilty, it makes me resentful towards you rather than gracious towards you. So the resentment that the person has additionally leads to feelings of more guilt. Since the person is aware that they should be grateful, right, rather than resentful. And so this in turn leads to new guilt, which generates more resentment, resulting in a destructive and vicious cycle in the person's life. These are all sorts of negative emotions that can affect a person in an anxiety type way, in a depression type way, uh, it, it, that result, that really all stem from a feeling of not feeling worthy, a feeling where you don't have a sense of self-worth, self-esteem. The, the key is recognizing that a loving father, right, our loving father in heaven, takes pleasure in providing for his children, particularly when he sees that they're doing their utmost to please him. When we're trying our best, really trying, and we're, we, want, we want to, we're trying to carry out the purpose, and we're learning, and we're praying, and we're, we're doing what we're supposed to do, God wants to help us. God wants to bestow goodness upon us. At any rate, as long as the children aren't doing something that is, that they're using their, the bounty, they're, they're using what God is giving them in a manner that's destructive, as long as they're not doing it for that purpose, the bounty will continue. A parent wants to give as long as the child is not using what they're giving, but what they've been given for a destructive purpose. Even if the child doesn't earn it per se, as long as they're not using it in a destructive fashion, the parent will continue to want to give. In, in work that I've done with, with folks in addiction recovery, especially when the, uh, the, the subject that we're talking about, the person in recovery, is, is a young person who's still being supported by their parents. And so sometimes we've had to have the discussion with the parents uh, about talking about the potential of withholding financial support from the child if the child is using it to buy drugs. Right? We speak about this sometimes as tough love because out of true love for their child, the parents are willing to take harsh measures in order to avoid enabling the child's self-destruction. If the child starts using something in a way that is destructive, that's the only time that a parent wants to, you know, to stop giving. 
But otherwise, if if a, if the child is trying and 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 they're not being destructive, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to bring themselves up. Parent always wants to give, and so it works a similar way with our Father in Heaven as well. Although we're not able necessarily to understand precisely how all of the observance of the commandments are to our advantage. It is a basic tenet of Jewishness. It is a basic tenet of the Torah worldview that this is the case, that the commandments are here for our benefit. God is complete and absolute perfection and, and doesn't gain or loss or have or lose uh, by our compliance or non-compliance in his will and doing what he wants. Transgression, right? Sin, right? Transgressions uh, um, of divine prohibitions are to our own detriment. It's not. To, it's not. We're not hurting God. So if we can attest that we've not used God's bounty inappropriately, that we've been doing what we have to do with God's bounty, we're trying our best, right? We're not been using it to our own detriment. Then we have every right to ask God to continue His bounty and to bless us with prosperity. If not by virtue of our merit, then at least the, then in the fulfillment of his, uh, of his promise to our forefathers. At least as, as someone who knows that they have a divine purpose in the world, the world recognizes that they have a divine spark within them and wants to uh, perpetuate the fulfillment of the purpose that they were created for. If you want bounty from God, to fulfill your personal purpose that God put you here for, God will continue to give it to you. You just got to make sure you're doing your part to recognize what your purpose in this world is. So the Torah tells us in many places that rejoice, right, being joyful, that we are obligated, we have a commandment to be joyful. So that makes the idea of being joyful, the idea of being happy, in a real sense, that's a mitzvah. It's a commandment. We're obligated to do it. And the derivative of this, right, the flip side of this, that means depression is a sin. But how can we say that? It seems like a really difficult, a really challenging, harsh thing to say. Depression is a sin? How can we say that to, that, that to be depressed is sinful? What's a person to do if something unpleasant happens? Right? And cause them to be sad. Since reacting to misfortune with sadness is a normal human response, how can a normal reaction be considered sinful? And so here we come to a very important distinction, both in, in the Torah context and in, even in a clinical context. Right? So it not only in a, is in a, in, a, in a Torah context, in an ethical, moral distinction, but also in a clinical context. Clinically, there is a distinction between someone who has distress or sadness and depression. A person might feel disappointed, disillusioned, dejected, unhappy, or in any other way, emotionally distressed. But true depression doesn't exist unless there's one important clinical characteristic, despair or hopelessness. There can be various intensities of despair, and when despair is very profound, it might lead to death wishes or to suicide. However, as long as the person has hope, as long as they have a hope of feeling better and that things will improve, the negative feelings, the distress, distressing as they might be, don't constitute depression. Hope is to joy what despair is to depression. So a Torah true person, even in the depths of dejection, even when experiencing disillusionment, disappointment, even when they're unhappy or emotionally distressed in any type of way, a Torah true person should find hope in his faith that God will never abandon him. God never abandons us. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov interestingly said there is no such thing in reality as hopelessness. Hopelessness doesn't exist. In other words, there's always hope. We're always connected with God. There's always hope. There's no such thing in reality as hopelessness. Despair does not exist. This is the teaching of Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. Now, 
the sitra achra, the, the animal inclination within us, has extraordinary powers. It can distort our perception of reality. That's a big deal. That's, that's, a, that's a scary thing. It can distort our perception of reality. It, 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 can dis, it can distort so much that we can delude ourselves. It can delude us and cause us to see things that don't really exist. I've, I've heard of psychotic patients. Patients who are psychotic, who have hallucinated. Yet we're still able to ask for help because they recognize that their sensory experience that they were having, vivid as it was to them, they recognized it to be unreal. Even under, right, even in a state of psychosis, these people were able to recognize unreal experiences as hallucination. And when Rabbi Nachman of Breslov said that despair does not exist in reality, he meant to say, if you feel hopeless, you should have the, uh, the presence of mind to recognize that this feeling can have no basis in reality. You should realize that the feeling of despair is a distortion of reality, a hallucination, a delusion that's brought about by the animal soul. It's like a pink elephant. It doesn't exist. Despair simply doesn't exist. If you feel despair, if you feel hopelessness, this should immediately trigger your awareness that this is a feeling which has no validity, and regardless of how intense and real the despair might feel for you, it's not to be taken seriously. There's always hope. Since there is no despair, there is always hope, and where there's hope, there can be joy. Um, let's hold there for today. God willing, we'll return uh, next time with another exciting lesson on how to better our world perception, better our inner spiritual growth. But the main key takeaway of this lesson today is that if a person feels worthy, and everyone should feel worthy, the fact that you woke up this morning means that you were granted, you were is that you were bestowed life for a purpose. That God has a purpose unique and special for you that only you can do. Nobody else who has ever lived or ever will live or currently living today can fulfill. You are special. You are significant. You are important. You are entitled to have a connection with God because inside of you there is God. And God has set a very specific mission for you. And by tapping into that, by realizing that, the more we understand that concept in a general sense, and the more we peel away the layers and see how that actually takes effect in our own life, the happier we'll be in the long term. And the more we will avoid feelings of anxiety and despair because of that. Because if I can rely, if I know that God is in my life, I can never be hopeless. If I know God is in my life and that God wants to give me bounty, if not for the things that I've merited, at least for the fact that I'm a child of God and therefore worthy, I can't be in despair and I can't be in anxiety. I'm living in a constant state of joy. Have a wonderful day.